Thank you, sir. I think we had excellent uh, talks today by Dr. Harvey Dattao and uh, Dr. Jamalul, and also one interesting and challenging case by Hari. Uh, so my talk was on uh, benign tracheal stenosis. Uh, so uh, I I hope I'm audible, sir. Yeah. 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 Just trying to share my screen. So I'll be presenting a case of a benign complete tracheal stenosis. Couple of slides. Uh, if uh, we have a lot of uh, causes for tracheal stenosis, but in our setup, the common causes which we see, I think the first thing, if you want to talk about tracheal stenosis, the most common cause we see is the pits. That that is a post intubation followed by post tracheostomy trauma, and then comes the TB. TB more often causes bronchial and bronchotracheal stenosis. But if we talk about isolated tracheal stenosis, pits is the commonest thing which we see in our part of the world. And uh, uh, the, the case I'll be showing is a complete tracheal stenosis. So how do you define a complete tracheal stenosis? We have this classification here, grade four, where we have no detectable lumen is a complete tracheal stenosis. So this is just one of the things which we look at when we try to decide what has to be done. As Dr. Jamalul has said, there are so many other things which we have to figure in, figure in when we have to decide the choice of therapy, including the site of stenosis, the length, the number, the comorbidities, and in India also the socioeconomic factors. So this case actually was a 30-year-old lady uh, who actually consumed organophosphorus uh, compound with a suicidal intent. Unluckily, she developed intermediate syndrome for which she had to be on ventilator for almost three to four weeks. And as a, pro as, as a part of this process, she was tracheostomized. She was finally weaned off ventilator, uh, given physio, and she was sent home. But sadly, uh, they tried decannulation multiple times but couldn't do. So that was when she had come to us. So when we had first seen her, uh, she was uh, uh, the vitals were stable. The neurological function was recovering, though she she needed still some support to stand and uh, walk. But uh, she was very depressed because she was not able to talk. So this is the X-ray neck which is uh, projected here. As you can see, the tracheostomy tube is there, and above the tracheostomy we see a complete abrupt cutoff of the trachea. Uh, so this was the bronchoscopy. Uh, view where we can see that above this is through the vocal cords and you can see that there's a complete cut off of trachea you can't even see any uh, pinhole opening of the trachea the same thing i'll just play a small video of it so again the same thing here you can see the uh, at, at around two to three centimeters from the vocal cords what you can see is a, a complete abrupt uh, cut off of trachea with no uh, um, pinhole opening so at this point uh, we discussed patient what had to be done. The offered surgical resection is one of the treatment options because if it is successful then it will be a lifetime cure for the patient. But then this was uh, refused by the family on two grounds. First was that she had already spent one and a half months in the hospital and they didn't want any more surgeries to be done on the person and also for financial reasons. Then we had two options either to leave her on tracheostomy like that or then to try a bronchoscopic approach, try to dilate and then see if we can proceed. So because she was already depressed with suicidal intentions and she was very upset that she was not able to talk, we tried to go through the bronchoscopic approach. So this was how we started. The, the first thing was to see whether we can, if at all, try to create a track. So this was what we, did, we had done. First, this is an electrocautery knife uh, <clears throat> to give the incision at the central part where you can see a small uh, white zone. <clears throat> So this is, uh, I think, one of the trickiest part when we have to try to open a complete cutoff because we have to be careful not to create an artificial lumen. So we, we just uh, made a small incision. We saw we were still not through. Then again, tried to go in a bit deeper. Normally, we get a giveaway once that stenosis is uh, uh, completely punctured. So there it is. So after this thing, we will like to see the tracheostomy through the opening here. So we were sure that we were in the uh, correct path. Then the second thing, even though we were sure, the second thing normally what we do in such a case is to reconfirm. So a guideware is being passed uh, <clears throat> through the rigid microscope. Uh, had this been in the bronchus, uh, 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 we, we can also use a fluoro to see where we are, but because we are a tracheostomy, the easier way was to see the guide wire now, which is the, through the bronchoscope passed to the tracheostomy. So now we have a guide wire passed across the stenosis <clears throat> from the vocal cord into the distal part of the trachea. Now that we, we have created the path, the next thing is to dilate the trachea. <clears throat> so this is something which is commonly done. 
serial CRE balloon dilatation starting from 6 mm, we can just go on. This is just a uh, video of the balloon dilatation being done and uh, once the balloon is adequately dilated, then you pass the rigid bronchoscope across the <coughs> stenotic segment into the distal trachea. Once this is done, we, are, we, we can be rest assured that uh, we have created a significant lumen. The last thing is to deploy a stent. In this particular patient, we, we decided to deploy the stent in the first instant itself. So this is a, a silicone stent which was deployed. It is being positioned. And once it is posi uh, properly placed, you have to open the stent is, uh, with, with either a balloon or using the forceps to open it up. So this is a stent now which is deployed across the <coughs> stenotic segment. Now this I think will be the first part of the story because the second part is follow up. So once we place a silicone stent for benign tracheal stenosis, it is a long story which, which will just begin. So this is a follow up bronchoscopy which was done uh, around four months after the stent was placed. Lucky we were in this case because there was no stent migration and, and no, no much granulation in this case. So this is just one, one case example of a, of a patient who had a complete tracheal stenosis where surgery was refused by the family. And we had to do a bronchoscopic approach and placed a tracheal benign silicone stent. So this is the pre-X-ray, where uh, uh, X-ray is showing a complete cutoff. And this is the X-ray following the stent placement, where we can see the lumen nicely in the lateral view. So similar experience, we have around four to five cases in the last two years. Uh, most of them prolonged ventilator, post-tracheostomy, upper third of the trachea, which is involved. Uh, surgical option is given to all of these patients. <clears throat> Two of them refused and bronchoscopic dilatation was done. One patient underwent surgical resection, but he had a re stenosis and we had to place a Montgomery T tube. The fourth person is due for surgical repair post COVID season. So this is again some images of the, the first one was the case which I had shown. Second is another girl with TB meningitis where she had a complete cutoff. Again, we had to place a, a do a bronchoscopic dilation place stand. The third is the guy who underwent surgical repair, had a re stenosis, and again we had to place a Montgomery T tube. So these are some cases of extreme benign tracheal stenosis where you don't see a lumen at all. But the most the but, but, but the more common variety is the one where you have some lumen to go inside, where our job becomes much easier. So to sum up, surgery definitely remains the cornerstone of management. But then uh, in our setup, I think bronchoscopic approach also has some role, especially when it recurs after surgery or the surgery is either unacceptable to the patient or surgery is technically not uh, feasible. I think with this, uh, I will end my case. Okay, very interesting. Uh, so let's start with the usual questions. First of all, very interesting and again, out of the box case Nagarjun, which uh, brings up some interesting points to uh, discuss. We start with the first two usual questions, the challenges and alternative techniques, which is non-surgery here. This time we start with Patabi. Sir, please unmute them. Yeah, a, a, a lovely job, Nagarjun. Uh, uh, this, this, I mean, all the cases uh, that you showed uh, was picture perfect, actually. And uh, yeah, we used to uh, get these kind of uh, cases uh, time to time. Um, the thing is, if it's too close to occult card, and, uh, I think that's where you have the challenge. The advantage is when the patient is on a trick, has to me, you can take your time, do a proper thing because the ventilation goes up from somewhere else, so you can actually do a job properly. Usually, you have a pucker, and from there, uh, you know, that would be a giveaway so that you can concentrate on that and then start dilating so that you don't really injure or go for a form of false track and all that. So, all this has been uh, the principles have been very clearly uh, shown. What are the alternate ways are, I mean, since it's too close, I mean, the easier way since there is already a tracheostomy is one thing is you dilate it and put in a Montgomery. So that will be a safer option for a few reasons. One is to do all this in one go. And if you don't, if you're not too sure about the vocal cards now, it, because if the patients are on tracheostomy for quite a while and suddenly they'll have to start, uh, uh, I mean, this is decannulation happening all at once with the stent inset. And if there is a problem, you might have to uh, intubate and all that for that it, a stent inset might be an issue. So those are theoretical uh, issues and hence to uh, uh, see whether it's okay. Montgomery is usually a very good idea because you always have a, uh, you know, tea and a thing inside. And third thing is what Ravi has actually described. It's a very fascinating thing. You have a uh, dilatation. You put in a stent on the top of a tracheostomy and have a Shailis and a tracheostomy with a stent, which actually is a Desi Montgomery, which has uh, all these uh, things put together. So 
all these three uh, things are actually possible uh, uh, if the patient doesn't want a surgery and this will be a useful bridge for a surgery also if the patient wants a surgery eventually uh, having some tracks for some time uh, and then see if the uh, if the patient doesn't get well after removal can always subject the patient to surgery i'm not too sure if i missed a lot but anyway a lot of uh, great people around to fill up uh, what i yeah so interesting but i think you've added very nicely to the discussion jamal your thoughts on this jamal unmute yourself please unmute yourself ma'am right okay there was uh, an extreme case of uh, tracheostenosis um was, i mean honestly i never you know done uh, such, such such a case before actually you know so there was a, a great job actually you know and um uh, you know uh, so it just shows that um, bronchoscopy bronchoscopic approach is an acceptable uh, um, uh, method to, um, to manage uh, post-intubation uh, trichostenosis, actually, you know. So, um, uh, although, you know, it's always uh, stated that, you know, surgery remains standard, but, you know, there, there are very few centers in the world that have experience in, the, in tracheal resection. So I, I think uh, uh, bronchoscopic approach will remain because there are always people uh, who are not suitable for surgery. And, um, and then I think there was a, a fantastic uh, case actually. You know, and I mean, the, uh, I'm not sure whether I was brave, confident enough to go through that, uh, uh, you know, that, that wall, you know, um, with hardly any opening at all, you know. So. I, I just want to know, I mean, uh, um, uh, were you guided by anything at all, you know, when you puncture that, um, that uh, piece of membrane, you know, to make sure that you didn't create a false lumen, actually, you know? So were you guided by anything, any Im imaging or anything at all? I think Dr. Patabi has said, normally you see a small pucker. Uh, uh, the, the, the central part of the trachea usually is little more wider than the remaining part. So I think that that is a place where we um, uh, start making the puncture. Or you, if, if, if the trachea is uh, concentric, uh, circular, then you, uh, you choose the central part to make a uh, first uh, incision. I think that is how we do. There's no other way I think which we can help us. The, I think the second thing is to have an idea of the length of the stenosis before we start doing it. If it is too long, I think it, it, it becomes a bit riskier. So all the three cases where we had done were uh, around uh, 1 to 1 point centimeters only. So it, it was not a uh, very long stenosis also. You never had any complications um, in any of these cases? So to be very frank, I think we in the last three years, we had five cases of uh, complete cutoffs in three we could successfully create a tract in, in one. I think it was more than two centimeters. So uh, we couldn't actually create a tract. So, so it was it. And the fifth case, we, we sent for surgery. We, we're just hoping that the surgery is done properly. Uh, yeah, so I think uh, Ravi, if I can make a quick comment. Absolutely, Dr. Prashant. I was waiting for you to get off the phone. Huh? <laughs> so, so I think, uh, you know, I think that's a very uh, interesting case. And I think all of us uh, come across these cases from time to time. I think, uh, like Pata mentioned, that you can have the puckering and that's the point of entry. Uh, and uh, like uh, I wanted to respond to Jamal saying that uh, you really need to have a very good CT scan to know what is the exact length uh, of the stenosis that you're working on. Now, the only one thing is uh, that, you know, Nagarjuna used the, uh, the knife to make the hole bigger and bigger. What I would typically do is I just want to have a hole enough so that a guide wire can I go like and it. balloon catheter can go. That's all. You know, so I would I limit the cotton, the use of cotton and the balloon uh, and the uh, knife as much as possible. But again, I say there's no right thing, there's no wrong thing. You know, it's you're guided by the situation then. But the principle would be yeah, as soon as your guide wire is going in and you think a balloon catheter can go up, you can do it. And uh, typically you can also use the, uh, the, you know, if you have the fluoroscopy and the dye in the balloon, just to see, you know, how the balloon is opening up, what pattern it is, is the balloon all across the stenosis or not. So I think these are some of the uh, additional points which one can use. But again, you are always guided uh, by what is the most appropriate thing on the site when you're doing the case. Lovely. Uh, Rajiv, the voice of experience. Yeah, yeah so I think that, uh, you know, the tracheal part, the tracheal complete stenosis is uh, 
sort of more amenable but if you get into a situation where you have a main bronchostenosis like this especially we've seen quite a few cases of left main complete stenosis that is where the chances of creating a false passage or you know uh, injuring a nearby uh, vessel becomes much more and uh, you know although uh, nagarjun did mention using a fluoroscopy but many times the collapsed lung around it you know it doesn't allow you uh, a very good image so we recently had a patient of wegner's granulomatosis you know giving rise to complete obliteration of the left main bronchus and although we used imaging and uh, you know everything and we tried uh, in a similar fashion to create a passage uh, but we were unable so it's a question of uh, you know how much your imaging can guide you in terms of the length of the obliteration that is there and i imagine that in that patient with wegner's the whole of the left main bronchus had you know kind of completely become adherent uh, and and because of loss of cartilage had become completely sort of fused so we were not able to create a passage uh, any experiences uh, dr jamal any experience about uh, you mentioned these young females you know with coming with the uh, complete obstruction so we have seen several of these young girls 18 to 23 years of age you know coming with complete obliteration of the left main bronchus and uh, have you been able to you know kind of uh, dilate any of those patients i mean sometimes you put a pin hole it becomes easier but if there is complete obliteration uh, you know we have not really been able to be very successful in those yeah. i mean i i, I mean uh, frankly speaking um, i have seen only one or two cases uh, of post tb stenosis where there was a complete obliteration of the lumen and i have never attempted uh, you know uh, any dilatation to, uh, uh, you know so um, yeah because they uh, to get an auto tomography kind of thing we're taking a risk actually we we try to uh, you know uh, puncture the um, the you know the, 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 the that's a thin membrane actually unless we are absolutely sure actually so i've never done myself actually you know Yeah, Ravi, you are the moderator, but you might you might uh, pull in, uh, say something about this. Okay, so some uh, some closure points on this. Thank you for the comments. In the interest of time, I'll make some closure comments. Nagarjun first, lovely case to bring uh, up. Uh, Ravi, Ravi, uh, can I interrupt for a second before we close it? I okay. think the, the I think the uh, I'll keep it short. I think the important thing here is that the uh, you know all of these main bronchial stenosis are very challenging and they are benign. Often the lung distillates or uh, often uh, you know uh, non-functional. so i think uh, that also adds a very important you, know, you need really a good reason to attempt the bronchial stenosis uh, opening in a benign condition you don't know how long it has been closed for and i think uh, all of i think i agree with uh, rajiv and others it's extremely difficult to uh, open up uh, the uh, the bronchi and, uh, compared to the trachea because you know that after opening the trachea you can ventilate and you can achieve something but if the distal lung is completely gone and uh, for a long time then i think it might not be worth the risk okay so lovely points by the panelists after this provocative case so nagarjun thank you for bringing up this case but since we have to always talk of some learning points and point counter point which is the whole uh, theme of the experience today few things out there one uh, the patient was just said didn't want surgery but understand that you take this up you're going to the chance of false tract is there so you're potentially looking at another surgery if something happens so that's something which you do and this is the classical phenomena of winging or walking the tight rope in intervention be as it may your success speaks for, for itself secondly we have also found that sometimes when you when patabi mentioned what conduit will you use so you have recanalization you have conduit recanalization has all the challenges has been talked about the conduit can either be as we talk, as he, as the stent you put in uh, which is like a large stent and i was wondering whether a little smaller could have been okay but it's a choice to make at the bedside the second is a t tube which is a safety paradigm and third is what we have described that you could take the tracheostomy and put a small stent on the top and that was published as an innovation in laryngoscope the issue to do some of these things is because the t tube and the or the other innovation will actually give you more insurance because if the stent again granulates up and below a 6 cm stent again you're looking at more procedures secondly the healing of the tracheostomy after a stent has been an issue we've had to deal with sometimes long standing tracheostomy you put a stent and that large hole to heal But because it actually granulates on the base, and the base is actually got a foreign body there, is a challenge you have to face. But something to think about when you look at all these things. Um, and and the final point is that uh, uh, ultimately these are out of the box things. The access is the main thing you guys talked about. 
So take care, larger lumen, puckering a bench is a very good point. If you don't have puckering again, you're winging it or walking the tight rope. And that is the main challenge. You use the cautery knife, you also use the vault tip. And very gingerly you go through, praying as you're doing that. And at the same time, you quickly try to see that you're constantly in the lumen. So again, a challenge. So novices should not look attempted unless a high degree of confidence is there. In terms of bronchial closure, as Ajeev talked about, very, very difficult because usually if they're eccentrically closed because of a vasculitic process or tuberculosis, that is winging of the highest order. All your conduits are angling. So unlike the tracheal opening, it's very difficult to open. And confessionally, the first one we tried many years ago wound up becoming a dehiscence. And that was the genesis of innovation number two when we had to block it up with the, with the <laughs> doctor we have described and, and to save that bronchus over there. So again, in the airways, it's challenging. The, what has been done in literature is that the end stent people, the Korean guys have described TB bronchostenosis of a complete nature where they've opened it in the bronchus, but it's extremely difficult to replicate and quite challenging to take on. So these are most of the points around this interesting case, which Nagarjun has described. Thank you so much, Nagarjun.